Hello, everyone, and happy Startup Week to you all. My name is Bradley Reichard, and I am a legally blind certified Salesforce administrator, as well as the head of education for a Denver based nonprofit known as the Blind Institute of Technology, or more simply, BIT. And BIT exists to address the unemployment epidemic among the people with disabilities community because within our community, unemployment statistics can range anywhere between 70 and 80%. And so in my role as the head of education at BIT, I often give presentations much like this one, where I present the idea of accessibility to organizations. And then once they've decided to do an accessibility initiative, and then train them on a more technical level about how they make their digital assets accessible for everyone. So without further ado, let's get into our topic of discussion for today, which is saying yes to accessibility, how and why your organization should do so. But before we get into the fun stuff, I do have a disclaimer I'd like to share with all of you. And that is that the information I provide here is not meant to be used for any legal or tax advice. It is solely meant to be a general overview of accessibility based on my knowledge, experience, and expertise on the subject. So if you happen to have questions of the legal or tax variety, I strongly, strongly recommend finding someone who speaks that language because that is not my forte. And now let's briefly talk about our agenda for this talk. Um, and we're going to begin by discussing definitions, standards, and resources for accessibility so that we have a foundation for the remainder of the presentation. Then we're gonna to transition to talking about two approaches to accessibility that organizations can take once they decide they want to implement accessibility. And then the remainder of the talk is gonna be comparing and contrasting these approaches, specifically how we implement either approach and the business case for either approach. And with that, let us begin asking ourselves, what is accessibility? And the reason we wanna ask this question, the reason we want to define accessibility is because if we can define it, then we can develop effective strategies for implementing it. So accessibility is the practice of building and designing products, services, environments, experiences, and anything else that people interact with in such a way that people with disabilities can use them. And when we talk about accessibility, there are two main contexts in which we do so. One is physical accessibility, which is the design of the physical world, such as building architecture or public transportation systems. And the second, and the, top, the focus of our conversation today is digital accessibility, which concerns things like website and app design. And when we're talking about digital accessibility, we often abbreviate it into the abbreviation A11Y, just in order to distinguish digital accessibility a little bit more from physical accessibility. And fun fact for you all, the A11Y abbreviation comes from the fact that there are 11 letters between the A and the Y in the word accessibility. So when we're talking about digital accessibility, we need to keep in mind the implications for websites. And by that, I mean the same sorts of standards that we apply to buildings for physical accessibility apply to websites and digital accessibility. So to, to parse out this analogy a bit for you all, if you imagine someone with a mobility impairment using wheelchair technology to access your building, someone like myself with a visual impairment would use screen magnification or screen reader technology to access your website. Another example of this is that many buildings have braille signage in front of rooms to tell a blind person what the purpose of the room is before they go into it. And on a website, the comparison here is to alternative text, which, we, which is descriptive text that is perceivable by screen reader technology, which describes images to blind users who obviously cannot see the image for themselves. And the same standards that I said apply to digital accessibility stem from two key pieces of federal legislation. The first being the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, specifically Section 508, and the second being the Americans with Disabilities Act, specifically Title III. Now, for our purposes today, we're not gonna dive into the nitty gritty of either of these pieces of legislation. It's just good enough that you know that they exist and that they prohibit discrimination on the basis of disability and set accessibility standards for any organization that does business with the federal government. 
But if you are interested in fundamental human rights legislation and regulatory uh, acts, then I strongly recommend looking into these on your spare time because they are very, very interesting and worth reading. And now if we want to consider the, those two pieces of legislation, the, the federal mandate, the, the why we do accessibility, then we can consider level AA compliance based on WCAG 2.1 or the web content accessibility guidelines as the how we do accessibility. And what the web content accessibility guidelines are, are a set of online resources put together by the W3C organization, which is a testable breakdown of every sort of element, component, and feature you could have on your website. And it discusses how you implement them in such a way that they, they are accessible and usable by everyone, including those of us with disabilities. But here again, for our purposes today, we're not gonna dive into the nitty gritty of them. It's just good enough that you know that WCAG is the standard both in the US and across the globe for web accessibility. Now that we've discussed what accessibility is, the standards and resources for accessibility, it's time to talk about the approaches to accessibility, beginning with the compliant approach. Now, a compliant accessibility company is one that is careful to stay on the side of legality. So it makes sure to follow all the laws, standards, and regulations that are relevant to the industry that it operates in. And in order to follow these laws, standards, and regulations, the company focuses its resources on consultants and employees who can expertly maintain and execute the desired level of compliance. And alternatively, you can be what is known as a confident accessibility company where you take what we call the confident accessibility approach. And here, your confidence generates self-trust, which comes from your own institutional knowledge of accessibility. And you can achieve this confidence by acting out your company values, which stem from creating a culture of accessibility both inside and out. Now, obviously, this leaves you with choosing between compliance or confidence as an organization. So to break down that choice very simply for you all, compliance is what you do to protect yourself from a lawsuit or recover after one, whereas confidence is what you do when you genuinely want to connect with users and customers who have a disability. If you genuinely want to create seamless, intuitive, and enjoyable user and customer experiences, then confidence is the approach you should take. And as it may sound, it is the more proactive choice and compliance is the more reactive choice. But it is worth pointing out that if your goal is to simply achieve some level of accessibility more than what you may currently be doing, then either approach will get the job done. And of course, I want to acknowledge that not every company will choose confident accessibility, either because they simply want to choose compliance or it's just not a realistic starting point for them, even if they believe that's the approach for them eventually. And after all, it is, it is natural to avoid this topic, this, this topic of accessibility, this topic of disability. So as I mentioned, some companies will simply focus on the law on compliance so they don't get close to the idea, idea of disability. Whereas other companies simply ignore accessibility altogether and hope that they don't get caught. And this, this desire to avoid the topic of accessibility, to avoid the topic of disability, it is very closely related to the idea of loss aversion, which is that satisfaction comes from avoiding a loss, but not necessarily from experiencing an equivalent gain. And this was an idea first described in behavioral economics by Dr. Amos Tversky and Dr. Daniel Kahneman. And Dr. Daniel Kahneman actually won the Nobel Prize in economics in 2002 for his work on this idea. But even with its roots in behavioral economics, this is a concept that can apply to our individual psychology and our social interactions. In the context of disability, for example, if you perceive someone to have a disability, you are subconsciously aware of their lack of ability or their impaired ability, and that makes you uncomfortable. But I wanna pause here and recognize that this is not something that is unique to people with disabilities. It is something that affects all of us, disability or not. And to, to share a bit of a vulnerable anecdote with you all, uh, as I mentioned, I am, I am legally blind. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that term, it means I have some usable functional vision, but it's not very good. And 
as I've come to meet more completely blind individuals through my time at BAT, I've had to come to terms with the fact that complete vision loss is something that terrifies me. And it's not because vision loss is this horrible condition from which you'll never recover, but it's just that my quality of life and my ability to function is dependent on the vision that I do have, at least to some extent. So the idea of, of not having the vision that I do have and trying to live life, it's a scary one. And, and I share all of that with you just to say that loss aversion truly is part of the human condition. It's not something to feel bad about. It's not something to feel guilty about, but it is something you should be aware of because it can drive our individual decision-making. And if it can drive our individual decision-making, then it can drive our corporate decision-making. It can affect whether or not we ignore accessibility altogether, whether we choose the compliant approach and simply avoid lawsuits and avoid getting close to the idea of disability, or if it's something we are aware of and mindful about, it can affect whether we choose the confident accessibility route where we are more personal, more vulnerable, and we seek to create gains for people instead of simply avoiding loss. And of course, I do wanna recognize that even if you choose compliant or confident accessibility, you might not know where to get started. You might not know how you tap into the people with disabilities community as resources, as talent. And that is where organizations like us at BIT come in. We believe that accessibility and assistive technology is the bridge that connects employers and professionals with disabilities from both an employment perspective and a consumer's perspective. And this isn't just a message that we as a disability nonprofit are preaching. It is something being embraced by some of the biggest brands in the world, like Salesforce, Google, Apple, Microsoft, and Amazon. And the reason for that is because technology neutralizes disabilities. These large brands recognize that if you bake accessibility into your technology, into your culture, into your organizational structure, you will benefit in terms of employment and in terms of having a diverse consumer base. But now I, I wanna pause again and let us all take a breath because I, I know that I have thrown a lot of information at all of you in these past few slides. While it's all very good information, it's all very helpful information. If there's just one bottom line I want you to have from this presentation, one takeaway, it is this, true accessibility requires perspective. And by that, I mean, people with disabilities due to our daily lived experience with dis disability, with using assistive technology and with identifying and overcoming accessibility barriers, we have a perspective that quite frankly, someone without a disability won't have. And that's not to say you won't do good work. If you only have people without disabilities working on your accessibility initiatives, because you certainly can do good work, but it is to say that there's gonna be a limit on how truly effective your accessibility initiatives are. So you can be a large organization, a Fortune 1000 company like a Salesforce or a Google, and you can have all the finances and talent in the world, but if your finances aren't being used to invest in people with disabilities from a talent perspective, you're only gonna be able to achieve so, so much accessibility. And to illustrate this point, I have two videos I would like to share with all of you. They're of my colleague at BAT, her name is Kayla, and she is a completely blind certified Salesforce administrator. And in these two videos, she's going to show us how she uses her screen reader technology to navigate the Salesforce interface and inter interact with an interface that typically re requires drag and drop functionality using mouth, uh, a mouse and sight. So here we are at the top of a test lead page that I've created for us with some record details on here. Um, I've slowed my screen reader down so that hopefully you can understand some of the audio output that I'm getting. So from a user perspective, what is nice about a page like this is that we have the lead's phone and email address in the highlights panel. So I'm able to quickly navigate to that, grab that information and use it as I need to in the course of my position. So we'll jump down there now. Let's test candidate heading level one. So lead test candidate heading level one. That's our main heading on the page. List of four items, list of six items, phone, five, email, send mail link tc at lynda.org. So there we have the lead's email address, and I'm able to grab that, copy, paste it, and use it as I need to. So 
A lot of Salesforce pages are laid out exactly like this with headings marking the page section. So I'm able to bounce around the page and navigate quickly to what I need. So for instance, our next heading down is path. That's heading level two. And this describes the workflow that we take leads through before we convert them over to a contact. But you know, phone and email address is not the only information that we track for leads in Salesforce. There are many other details that, that we track. So I'm able to navigate just as easily to the details tab to grab that information as well. Tab setting level two, blank. Activity tab selected. Details tab. Enter. Select. Tab. Lead information heading level three, but. And there we are on the details tab with all of this other information right at my fingertips, easily accessible for me to use as I need to throughout the course of my job. And similarly to the activities tab, this page is also marked out by headings. So potential candidate information heading level three. Potential candidate information. Qualifications and interests. Qualifications and interests. And just all the other things that we track throughout the course of our work. All right, so here we are in the Lightning App Builder. I've chosen to create a new Lightning App page and we're gonna give it a quick name. I've sped my screen reader up to its usual speed so you can hear what it sounds like for me. And next. So what's nice about this page here is I am choosing the layout of my Lightning App page and how I want that template to look. And actually, when I make my selection, I'm given a text of what this looks like, which is handy for me since I can't see what the pages look like. So I'll just select header with a left region and finish. So I know you may not be able to see my keyboard focus as I'm navigating around this page, so I'll do my best to describe what I'm doing. So this page allows you to add components to a page, drag them around, drop them where you want, move them. And navigation like that is typically done with a drag and drop interface with a mouse. And that isn't something that as a blind admin, I'm able to do very easily. So Salesforce has implemented a handy keyboard um, interface here that I'm able to use to accomplish that same task. So. I'm going to go ahead and add a component to this page. And I'm going to pick chatter feed from the components. And there we have it on the page. But, you know, maybe I don't want it in this position. Maybe I want it in a different position on the page and I'm not able to use the mouse to do that. So what I'm able to do is navigate to where I've placed the component. And hit enter. Control X to cut that to the clipboard. And Control V on the position where I want it to be placed. Enter and Control V. And I'll just verify that that has moved. And it has. So without having to touch the mouse at all or worry about an interface that I can't see to use, I am able to complete this task accessibly with the keyboard. Isn't that impressive? If I can just brag about one of my colleagues, that video, I, I see it every time I do this kind of presentation and it always leaves me amazed. Uh, for those of you that are curious, in the second video, Kayla's screen reader is set to read at 160 words per minute, which is pretty darn fast. But if you really want to knock your socks off, I highly recommend Googling or YouTubing uh, blind screen reader users who can have their screen readers set to 300 or 400 words per minute. It is, if you're familiar with speed reading as something sighted people can do, consider this speed listening. And now to transition away from these demos, let's begin talking about how we actually achieve both approaches to accessibility that we've discussed so far, beginning with how we achieve compliance. And for those of you that like step-by-step -step procedure, procedures, you will appreciate that this is a three-step process, beginning with the audit. And here you'll audit whatever digital asset it is you're trying to make more accessible. Let's say, for example, your website. You would examine your website through the lens of a resource like the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and you would identify any and all content and features 
that are completely, completely inaccessible or at least extremely frustrating for certain types of users to use. And then once you've finished auditing every aspect of the digital asset you're trying to make more accessible, it is then time to plan how you're going to address what your audit found. And here you'll ask questions such as, are we going to lean on our internal resources for this? Or are we going to seek outside help? And are we going to leave our website on its current platform and just tweak the code a little bit? Or are we going to move it to a new platform altogether, one that is more systematically accessible? And once you have finalized your plan, it is then time to execute that plan. And here, the most key part of executing any good accessibility plan, whether it's compliance or confidence, is to include people with disabilities in every step of that process. And the reason is if you do that, the quality and consistency of the compliance level that you achieve will be much, much higher than if you do not include people with disabilities in that process. And so now you, you may be wondering, all right, what is, what is possible with compliant accessibility? And I will be very, very frank with all of you. You will do the bare minimum for accessibility from a legal perspective. It will keep you out of court. You will not have to go through accessibility litigation, but just because you're doing the bare minimum and just because you're okay from a legal perspective doesn't mean you're actually accessible for a real person with a real disability. And to illustrate this point, I wanna share with all of you some recent accessibility legal action uh, for some pretty big brands that I'm sure we've all heard of, Harvard, Domino's, Nike, Five Guys, et cetera. These organizations chose to neglect accessibility, even from a compliance approach, and found themselves in court having to pay legal fees and then do the accessibility work anyway, when they could have saved a ton of money by simply addressing accessibility from a compliance approach to begin with. But I want to caution you all here and, and make sure that you understand that even from a compliance approach, accessibility is not a one-time effort, the kind of thing where you check a box and you're done and you never have to think about it again. It is instead an iterative process, one where you are in a constant state of reiterating and reevaluating your digital assets. And the reason for that is as technology continues to evolve and as you continue to have more diverse consumer and clients, consumers and clients, you will have more variety in the types of users who interact with your systems more variety in the types of technologies they use to interact with your systems and more variety in the type of accessibility barriers that they encounter. And so I would then like to consider all of you, I would like all of you to consider achieving confident accessibility, which as you might notice from this diagram is not as procedural a process as achieving compliance. But just because it's less procedural doesn't mean it's any harder to do or shouldn't be pursued at all. It just means that achieving confidence is a more holistic approach, one where you can implement each of these components simultaneously. And one of these components is a mindset shift, both at the individual level and the organizational level. And here you're going to ask questions like, at the individual level, do I have unconscious bias towards people with disabilities? And does the idea of working with or selling to someone with a disability make me uncomfortable? While at the organizational level, you'll ask questions such as, why haven't we tapped into people with disabilities from an employment or consumer perspective? And why don't we have a dedicated accessibility team? And as you're asking these questions and undergoing this mindset shift, you might also begin to get curious about how accessibility software works, such as the screen reader technology that Kayla showed off for us in her demo videos. And while this mindset shift and this curiosity, while these are important and valuable things, here again, the most important part of achieving confidence, just like with achieving compliance, is to include someone on your team who has the disability, who uses the assistive technology you're curious about. Because if you do so, I guarantee you that you can be much much more confident in your accessibility initiatives than if you do not include these individuals in that process. And now I want to talk to all of you about what is possible should you choose confident accessibility. And the short answer is it's not only the, the right thing to do, if you will, the, the, the feel good story that everyone might be able to buy into, but it's good for business. 
And I say that based on a report that Accenture put out in summer of 2020, and they found that organizations that have hiring practices, which are inclusive towards people with disabilities, can experience 28% higher revenue, 30% higher economic profit margin, and two times the net income of their industry peers. And the reason for that is fairly simple. It's something we've talked, touched on a bit already. And it's that if you have people with disabilities on your teams and involved in your design process, if you take accessibility seriously from that perspective, you are almost guaranteed to create more accessible products, services, and experiences. And if you have more accessible products, services, and experiences, then people with disabilities from a consumer perspective are much more likely to spend their money on what your organization has to offer. And speaking of people with disabilities from a consumer perspective, that same Accenture report found that in the US, consumers with disabilities are estimated to have around $490 billion of disposable income and $21 billion of discretionary income annually. And that second figure, the $21 billion of discretionary income, that is actually larger than that of African-Americans and Hispanics combined. So all this to say, if you're not investing in people with disabilities from a consumer perspective or an employment perspective, you are missing out financially. And the last thing I want you all to consider from this, this slide is that consumers with disabilities compared to consumers without disabilities, we oftentimes have less choice in the marketplace uh, due to the fact that some companies, as we've mentioned, ignore accessibility altogether. And other companies, while they at least try at accessibility, they don't always do a good job. So when we find an organization that not only clearly values accessibility, but does it well, we are, we are likely to give you our money and stay loyal to you as well. And with that, I would like to, to thank you all for your time and attention today. It has been a pleasure to talk with all of you about a topic very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I know that, that Startup Week has a mechanism for questions and answers, but if you would like to contact me directly, my email is on screen. It is bradley.reichard at blindit.org. And with that, that is all I have for all of you. I hope you have a great rest of Startup Week and take care.